Hi! It's Writing Wednesday, and this is Janet Fitch. I'm just back from my book tour. Uh, Chimes of Alaska Cathedral has uh, well and truly launched. Um, and uh, being back to, um, back in LA, it's been, um, uh, it's been uh, quite a pleasure to meet writers, to meet readers, to answer questions about the book. Um, uh, I found it's, uh, I learned things about my own book uh, that I didn't know. Uh, I was surprised, usually on a, on a hardbound tour, you haven't read, met people who've read the book yet. Uh, but this time I met people who'd read the book. Uh, I met a woman who uh, is the owner of a big bookstore in Northern California, a Book Passage, whose book club read Marina and uh, read Chimes of Lost Cathedral, um, the second book of the two Russian books, and said that she, um, the book club started with Chimes of Lost Cathedral and then went back and read, uh, many of them hadn't read uh, Marina, uh, the Revolution of Marina, and went back and read the first book, second, and said that that was the perfect way to read it. So uh, if you're wondering whether you need to start with the Revolution of Marina M, you don't. Uh, I have a cast of characters and notes on where we left them in the last book, so uh, if you're like me, you can just dive in. You don't have to wait. So... Um, I, uh, it was fantastic to m meet so many people. So, some of you came actually to my, to my readings in various places. Um, it was, um, it was quite an experience. And then I returned uh, from my readings. Hi, oh my goodness, I see so many people um, that I actually have seen uh, in real time. Well, welcome. Um, so what I want to talk about um, with uh, uh, today is that Toni Morrison, uh, uh, one of our great novelists, a Nobel Prize winner, um, uh, somebody instrumental in shaping our American cultural mind at this moment, uh, beleaguered as it is sometimes, um, but building, widening the scope of what can be written about, widening the number, the kind of voices that we're hearing from. Um, Toni Morrison was um, probably one of the most, if not the most, influential writer, um, at least in America, um, in the last. 50 years. And she did it. She, um, you don't accomplish that kind of thing without an absolute a sense of absolute dedication and confidence that what you have to say, what you write about is of value. And, um, we have trouble with that. Writers do have trouble with that. We think who the heck is going to care about this. But if you tackle a story that um, where there are a lot of secrets, you know, cultural secrets, um, a lot of humiliation, a lot of, of uh, you know, intense feeling, you're going to hook into that feeling culturally. And it's going to be uh, very different than a story that you just are moving people around because it's interesting and, you know, you can... Um, you know, work up a little fire rubbing, you know, something against something else versus, you know, stripping the curtains off the windows and noticing that there is a giant fire uh, uh, roaring right outside the house, uh, which is more what Morrison did. She was absolutely fearless writer. Um, she was somebody of great talent, uh, great talent, great courage, um, and the willingness to um, utilize them utterly, utterly. She held nothing back. 
Um, she never felt, oh, do I deserve to be in this conversation? Oh, do I, will people respect me? Oh, you know, uh, uh, is it going to be too much for people? Blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. She was the one who said, you need to hear this. I need to write this, you know, no matter how hot, uh, what she was writing about, how much hurt, how much trauma, uh, whatever secrets she was going to delve into, she did not hesitate uh, to um, create art out of that. Uh, so the books are, you know, fabulous, engaging uh, works of art. Uh, characters are memorable and... Um, very human, appealing, but vulnerable and full of flaws and, um, you know, uh, people in all their complexity. Uh, but her subject matter is, uh, you know, was a great American wound is the great American wound of uh, the legacy of slavery and racism in this country. Uh, add to that misogyny, add to that everything else all the injustice that links up to that um it can be these are very tender inner feelings as well it's not just it's not a diet they're they're not in no way a diatribe about um about you know american injustice and you know the the um um uh, you know the great wound that we carry it's like the original sin uh, that we still are struggling with um, but her first book I remember reading um, The Bluest Eye for the first time and just it you know talking about a young black girl's um, fondest desire to be to have blue eyes like Dick and Jane in the school books and this was something that had never been written about you know, people could write about this kind of thing in the abstract, but when you have to see the world through that child's eyes, you never forget how that feels. And, uh, you know, the it was 1970 when Bluest Eye came out. I was in high school. And, uh, you know, it made you see the world differently. It made you understand people differently. You know, you look at your schoolmates and, you know, everybody seems to be moving forward in their life. Um, but you look at them and realize the wounds that they are carrying and, um, makes you look at your own wounds and go, gee, you know, this is not something to bury. This is the subject. This is, you know, we, you know, Everybody likes to feel good all the time. This is an American failing, you know. We like to feel good all the time. And uh, what we do is we bury the stuff we don't want to look at. I, I was, um, when I was traveling uh, with my book, there was a, a driver of one of these uh, long distance cars that I was, uh, the publisher sent to take me to, from. San Francisco to Sacramento, God knows why. Uh, mine is not to reason why, right? Uh, and she was saying, you know, these people, I don't understand why these people talk about their me too, you know, and some uncle did this or, you know, brother did that or somebody uh, at work, you know, um, did such and such. Why don't they just get over it? Why don't they just move on and why do they have to dwell on things? And wow, you know, the unexamined life. Uh, you know, the idea that the harm that, in, you know, that culture uh, does to people, the harm that we, you know, our culture does to us, that people personally acting for that culture do to us because they feel they have the culture says you have the right to do this to vulnerable people you have the right to um you know we're for selling something uh we have the right to uh make you feel shitty to so we can sell you something 
And uh, if white supremacy is what they're selling, then, uh, of course, everybody else, you know, pays the price of that. There's a wound that is, um, uh, it can be healed, but I think it, it is healed by artists. That's one of the, you know, the deepest functions of art in a culture is, you know, how do you heal these wounds? I think recognition that they exist and not burying yourself in the sand, just get over it, you know, life is tough and, you know, pull up your socks. That's what people do. That's what people do. But the weight of that really is, um, uh, is oppressive and it, um, it kills the spirit and it, uh, it taints the whole culture. It taints our society. So when we had a book like The Bluest Eye of this girl who, because she was dark, you know, really internalized um, a self-image of being ugly and that only those blue eyes would make you beautiful. Um, interracial, uh, you know, intraracial um, it's an accommodation to that societal um, wound where even within a culture, within a race, how assimilated are you? How, you know, um, you know, if you're, if you're, you know, within the black community, you know, the color barriers within the race, um, people's perceptions, uh, she was questioning all of that. She dragged it out of the closet and just put it in the body of the small child, you know, so that you really could see it. You could really experience it. You could look at your fellow man and go, wow, this is what people have been experiencing all the while. Make it very personal. Um, I just, you know, Toni Morrison's books abound with ghosts because the wound of, of slavery, of racism in this country, um, I mean, the hideous cruelty that continues. I mean, we're seeing it back again. It's just, no, it's never disappeared. It's not like this is not who we are. This is like, this is who we are. This is part of who we are. America is very conflicted against itself. And Toni Morrison went right there. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, so here it's Writing Wednesday. You know, what are we learning from Toni Morrison? I'm not trying to give you a lecture about her and her works, but you have the little, the little ghost in Beloved. I mean, this, metaphorically, there is a ghost, you know, haunting America. And what are the, you know, looking at the ghosts in, you know, in your perception to move towards that, that pain, you know, of thinking that, that you can't be beautiful because you not, you'll never be Dick and Jane. And if you could be, have blue eyes, you would be beautiful. And then you would be part accepted and part of culture. What the thing that crowbars that culture open is to show and identify and empathize with that wound. So what in your own life, you know, where has the culture damaged you? You know, what are you supposed to keep quiet about? Where are the ghosts uh, in your life? Who's missing? You know, Toni Morrison was, you know, as a writer was this exemplary. She, you know, she busted every single um, commonplace about writers, especially women writers. She had children, you know, oh, don't have children if you're going to be, oh, you're going to have a life if you're, you know, if you're a woman in society, you, you're going to have a life. And some of us are going to have children, some of us are not going to have children, but having children used to be thought of as you couldn't be an artist, you couldn't be a writer uh, unless you decided not to have children. She had children. She was a single mother. She got up at four in the morning and she wrote. She held down a straight job, a very important job. She became an editor. Um, 
And she wrote, and she put her finger always where it hurt. Um, and if you are somebody who uh, wants to protect your your poor characters, think about Toni Morrison. You know, great writing, lasting, important writing goes to where the pain is and doesn't stick its head in the sand. Um, if you, you know, one says, oh, well, I can't write unless I have, I'm full time, you know, a writer. I, I still am working. How can I possibly have time? You know, oh, I have to go to the market, you know. It can be done, you know, if you value yourself and your contribution enough, it all gets done. There's time to do it all. But there's a singularity of purpose and a seriousness about yourself. You know, I mean, Toni Morrison, anybody who met her said, you know, what the sense of she could be very easygoing and casual, but there was a sense of gravity about her, that she had a mission. She had something really important to do. And she felt that the safe place was inside her writing. Even if she was writing very difficult material, she always felt safe inside the writing. Uh which is uh, something that people who shy away from difficult subjects maybe don't think about enough. Um, I have not, um, I haven't read her, uh, the, there's a book about self-respect um, that I have not read yet, and I should. Now that, that she's gone, she is left behind her mind. Her mind has been left behind. She, you know, she. it's going to be a tremendous loss for the people who knew her personally not to have her alive in their lives. But the one thing about writing more than any other art form is that the her mind will always exist in the world and will continue to affect us. You know, so I, for one, am super excited about going back and reading, starting to read her again. I, I, uh, I realize, um, I've read Beloved twice. I've read Bluest Eye several times. And then my favorite jazz, uh, I've read that about three or four times. <laughs> she is somebody you can always study from you know we talk about using books as textbooks really tear them apart and see how they're put together uh, her books will really benefit from that you can learn so much about uh, how a story could be put together from her um, I think that um, Nobel laureates there's a certain kind of writer that the Nobel committee uh, I mean, until it lost its mind recently. <laughs> Let's not even go there. Um, but until recently, there was a certain kind of literature that was um, favored by the Nobel Committee, which is a literature that took the point of view that um, empathy is created in literature and um, the whole human race is uplifted by great literature. Um, so the great cynics do not generally win <laughs> uh, uh, Nobel Prizes, but they also tend to move to the big issues. And there's something about being willing to find the, the big issues in the personal lives, which is what we're human beings, you know, we're not walking billboards and shibboleths, you know, we're, we have the, it's where the history comes to bear on the individual. It's where culture comes to bear on you and me and my family and the kids at school and the people at the workplace. Um, and these novels will continue to be written, but Toni Morrison has had her say, she's had, um, how many books? I didn't count them. My Wi-Fi is out. Hmm. Oh, well. Um, we just roll with it. You know, the idea of, of waiting until everything's perfect. Nothing's ever perfect in the physical world. So you jump in and do it. And um, 
but I'd say she has 12 books, I guess, and pieces of her brilliance in each book. And so they come together in, in different uh, configurations. She does a lot of historical work um, and just giving voice uh, often to the unexceptional um, individual and showing the world uh, that's inside each individual that when they pass, a world is lost. And when Toni Morrison passed, man, a world was lost. I got to say, I, I met her once in the rain in Paris. I saw her walking. She was very, very recognizable. She looked like a queen. And I was having some coffee uh, and looking out in the rain, and I saw her uh, passing with an umbrella passing by the window and I swear I got up and ran out there and kind of followed her and she was uh, in a doorway uh, looking for keys <laughs> probably and I said are you Tony and she said yeah and uh, I introduced myself and just told her um, you know what uh, what a profound effect that she's had on me and my ideas about writing and uh, and uh, she'd read White Oleander which made me feel really good um, you know, they walk among us, these, these giants, they walk among us and we can, we can build on what they've done. Uh, so, uh, hope you read some Toni Morrison and, uh, thank you for, uh, thank you for, uh, watching and, uh, we'll, uh, see you next week. Okay.